Hey there. Um, today we're on the subject of groaning, and I did mention Romans 8, but I thought um, we could actually jump to it just to look at it to see what other things pop out. Um, but we're in 2 Corinthians 5, and we've been talking about what the life of faith is, right? The life of faith is walking <laughs> according to what we do not see believing what God has said of us in Christ, which he reveals through the New Testament ministry, right? And uh, as we look away to him, really, we're brought into situations where he becomes very real to us because of our need. You know, he's not so real to you when you are full of self-sufficiency. You know, Paul said in uh, Philippians, I've learned how to abase and I learn how to abound, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think a lot of us know how to be a base, but we really don't know how to abound and still keep our grasp on the Lord. Um, prosperity and ease can take us off, or self-sufficiency can take us off. Self-righteousness can take us off from our sense of need, right? Um, but Paul learned how to enjoy Christ through every bit of it. He transcended all of it. And uh, David's prayed, you know, Lord, don't give me too much or too little. Teach me to be content. And I think that that's really where we want to be. We want to be not in a situation of desperation all the time, but we want to be content and not carried off by successes. You know, um, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about you get a YouTube channel and you've only been a Christian for two years and because you're trafficking in dreams and rapture stuff, all of a sudden you've got 30, 40,000 people watching you. You're not going to stay close to the Lord. You can't, not many, not many people can survive that even if they were healthy. <laughs> you know, to stay pure before the Lord, it's better to have a little with the Lord than divide the spoil with the wicked, right? And when you start to realize what your flesh is and how untrustworthy you are you'll start to fear not just having not enough but also fear having too much because self-sufficiency can keep you from sensing your need of the Lord and dry you up prosperity can self-sufficiency uh, strength lots of good works very busy schedule in the Lord you, you could just be carried off from him are the reality of our Christian life is inward. It is while we, it is the glory that is wrought into us while we look not to those things which are seen, but to the things which are unseen. But it's not just like glancing at the Bible. It means that you are gazing at Christ and drinking from him. And something of the knowledge of his glory is being imparted to you. And the best place for us is to be in a place of need. It just seems like God you know, he gave Paul, we'll talk, we'll talk later about the thorn in the flesh, a, a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him so that he wouldn't be overly exalted by all the revelation he had. Knowledge can do it. Bible knowledge can do it. Carry you off from the Lord himself. It's a good thing to groan with a sense of need. God has wrought us for that very thing to groan inwardly and say, oh, Lord Jesus, if I have, if I don't have you, I've got nothing, you know. And in a sense, it is a good thing that we understand where we are in world history, that we know that the world system is not sustainable. We know the Lord is going to come and judge it. We know that there's no future for us here. We're not hoping in this life. But being in that position does not necessarily mean that you're really looking away to see the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what's lacking in the rapture community is that they have a very superficial knowledge of grace and they don't see that grace is Christ himself coming to you to be wrought into you um, to cause you to know him and enjoy him and be filled with him. And so it's not that they're not saved by grace, but they're not enjoying the Lord. They're at the point where they realize they've got nothing here in this world, but they're just miserable. You know, we need to take the next step, which is to look away to Jesus. That's why Jesus said, uh, when you see these things begin to come back, come to pass, look up 
Lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Do you think lifting up your head means looking at the Revelation 12 sign or looking at astrological charts to see where the next asteroid's coming? No, looking up it means looking to where your redemption comes from. According to Titus, that famous book uh, verse about our blessed hope is that it is the appearing of our great God and Savior from heaven, Jesus Christ. And uh, Colossians says, you know, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things above and not on the earth beneath, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested, then we will be manifested with him in glory. To look up means to look at the right hand of God where Christ is seated. Hebrews says, we don't see everything subjected to him yet, but we see Jesus, right? We, by faith, see that he has been enthroned. He accomplished the work. He is waiting for his enemies to be made his, be made his footstool, and he's been made head over all things to the church, including us, and he, does, he is heading up everything in our life. And we know that by faith. Okay, more and more our gaze needs to be on him because he's coming. And that's what it means to watch. Watchfulness is not watching earthquakes and counting the number of plagues and fires and natural disasters and rumors of war. No, watching is watching for Jesus Christ. And people tell me, you know, say, well, he teaches that rapture watching is idolatry. Well, yeah, if you're looking at those things and not Christ, you're not actually watching. And he's still going to come upon you unaware. I think there's a lot of people he's going to catch you off guard who think they're watching because they're not learning to abide in him. We are not looking at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary and the things that are unseen are eternal. And we have this tabernacle that we're in, that's the realm of the seen, and it's going to be dissolved. And that reminds me of what Peter says, right? They're looking to the day of God in which the heavens will be dissolved. All the things in this world are going to be dissolved. So we should be walking in reverence and awareness of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, what is that? It is the awareness of his presence and glory. I don't live unconsciously of him. I don't live insensitively to him. I live by faith knowing that my life is right in front of him and he is, his gaze is upon me, you know, and that affects the way I work, it affects the way I live. And that's what even Paul's going to talk about here is he's going to bring us to the fear of the Lord in the judgment seat, but it's not a bad fear. We, we'll have to dispel some of the notions when we get to that. But right now we're still talking about groaning <laughs> and the groaning is something good that's produced in weakness that many who are self-sufficient don't know this groaning. We're not just talking about complaining about your lot in life and wishing you could go home. We are talking about a groaning that comes from the pledging of the Spirit as you look away to those things. The more you look to Jesus and you realize he's your sufficiency, the more you want him. And that produces a longing to be with him and us and a groaning in this tabernacle. Not that we would be found naked, but that we would be clothed upon with life. We start groaning for our house in heaven. This is a spiritual groaning, not just complaining that we're here. You know, I, I get it. We're complaining that we're here. We wish the Lord would come, but that's not necessarily the same thing as the inward groaning that's produced by the pledging of the Spirit, that on the one hand is a taste of the reality of the Lord and makes us so conscious that He is real, and on the other hand makes us long to be with Him and gives us a sense of futility in this life. Um, so we want to be careful because there are a lot of people who say, well, I just can't wait to get out of here. My life is so miserable. And then when you say the groaning, they go, oh, see, that's what I'm doing. No, not necessarily. You could be murmuring and complaining like they did in the wilderness not believing that God really is for you and is going to bring you into the good land and take care of everything for you. You're feeling like it's all on me and I'm miserable and I'm mad at him. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a groaning that actually comes out of enjoying the Lord, out of appreciating who he is, out of looking away from what I am and what I see with my eyes to who he is. And as I do that, there's a corresponding foretaste, a pledge of the Spirit in my heart that makes me taste his sweetness and say yes. But then from that, there is a, also a groaning where I just realize without him, I am nothing. 
Okay, that's not the same thing. It is a longing to be at home, but it's more more than anything a longing for his presence. Where you are just like, I, if I don't have Jesus, Lord, I feel so dry. I feel so abnormal because my home is in Jesus' presence. It's not just away from all my problems. It's without the presence of Jesus, something doesn't feel right. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure how to explain it better than that. It's not just complaining. It is a groaning produced by our sense of the spirit. Um, and then let's, so that, so that brings us to Romans eight, right? Uh, okay. And he talks about being led by the spirit of God, right? We, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God for you've not received a spirit of uh, bondage again into fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption, which we cry Abba father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Now, that is talking about how the Spirit bears witness with your spirit while you are setting your mind on the things of the Spirit. It's the same thing. What are you doing? You are looking to and acknowledging the realities of who Christ is in you and what you have in him. And the Spirit is witnessing with your spirit. Well, that's the same thing as pledging. The Spirit, when he witnesses with your spirit that you are a son of God, is pledging and giving you a foretaste. That's that foretaste. It's a taste of the goodness of God, a taste of the gift of Christ. Um, so the witness of the Spirit corresponds with the pledge of the Spirit, in my view. And he says, if we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's what the Spirit bears witness to. In contrast to a spirit of bondage and fear, by the way, but we're not touching that right now. Um, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Now, everybody goes here and says, oh, we have to suffer with the Lord or we're not going to be glorified. And that means to take up your cross and that means to deny yourself and obey the commandment. No, what he's talking about with this suffering is the groaning. Because he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's the same thing 2 Corinthians 4 is talking about, the glory that's wrought in us. These momentary light afflictions are working in us an exceeding weight of eternal glory while we look not to those things which are seen, but to the things which are unseen, right? And then he says, uh, the glory that's going to be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. He says, sorry, my, my son was uh, starting to play trains. I can't do a video while he's doing trains over there. Uh, for the earnest expectation of the creature. Now, what is that? That is the groaning. That's the longing to be clothed with life. The creature speaks of this creation and especially our mortal bodies, right? It, what does it wait for? The manifestation of the sons of God, the glory that's going to be revealed in us. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together now. What are these? These are birth pangs. This is talking about birth pangs. And you know we are in the time of the birth pangs, right? So there should also be a corresponding groaning in the sons of God who are being prepared to be glorified because that's what the earth is groaning about, is the manifestation of the sons of God and the glory that's going to be wrought, revealed in us, which is being wrought in us now as we look not to those things which are seen, but to the things which are unseen. So in a way, we kind of have a part in this, right? We need to be looking up. We need to be looking at Christ. And this is kind of a groaning. And we saw in a, uh, Corinthians that that groaning is a sense of weakness and being burdened and weighed down. It does not feel glorious. It feels like, uh, oh, Lord Jesus. It feels like futility. It feels like vanity. It feels like more and more I'm reduced. And as the saints in the end, who are ready to be with the Lord, who really are watching Philadelphia, what do they, what do we know about them? They have a little strength. He says, you have a little strength, but you've not denied my name. A little strength means the least amount of strength. We don't have strength. And part of that's from God. He's actually working in us to 
bring us into weakness as a preparation <laughs> to transfer our attention out of the realm of the seen and into what the glory is that's going to be revealed into us, which is Christ himself. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together till now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now there, here's the words first fruits. It's the same as pledge, because the first fruits of a harvest is a sample portion that a farmer would take to see how the crop is, right? It's the same thing as the pledge where, or the foretaste, where he gets a sample of the land to see how good the land he bought is. This is the same thing. We have the first fruits of the spirit. This is the sample, the taste, the foretaste of what is to come of the glory. And because we have the first fruits or the pledge, we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now we are already sons of God. Okay in our spirit we've been regenerated we're actually born into god's family but we're also going to be adopted which is when our body is transfigured and redeemed and we enter the fully qualified status as manifested sons of god presented as the heirs okay um and then he says for we are saved by hope but hope that is seen is not hope for what a man sees what does he hope for again this hope is produced in us because of our faith not by what we see looking at israel looking at the magog invasion looking at all the earthquakes and everything is not what produced the hope no it's our faith in christ christ is the object of our faith those things are the outward signs but our groaning is produced from something deeper than that it's produced from the fact that we have the first fruits of the spirit and we receive the first fruits we were regenerated after we believe the gospel believing the person and work of jesus christ is what brought us the spirit not believing that we're in the end times mormons believe we're in the end times masons believe we're in the end times luciferians believe we're in the end times Believing you're in the end times does not necessarily mean that you are groaning, right? No, it is those who are who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown within themselves. That's us. And we're brought into weakness, while the rest of the world seems to be brought into strength. They, they're they living on the adrenaline of the hour we're in. And some of the rapture hours, rapture hour, rapture watcher people seem to live on the adrenaline of the earthquake monitoring and the storms and the financial collapse and the aliens are coming and the mark of the beast and all that. It's an adrenaline thing. It's a dopamine hit. No. The more we are captured with Jesus, the less that stuff excites us and also the weaker we feel. We are being taken down a different path if we are really being made ready. Now, I believe all genuine believing saints will be raptured, but not everybody's awake. Like he said in Thessalonians, there's those who are asleep and those who are awake, those who are drunk and those who are sober. And we're supposed to be sober and we're admonished to be awake. And it's possible for him to come upon you and you're not abiding in the Lord. Like John said, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, you may have confidence that his coming and not shrink back in shame. We want to be have our conscience perfected. We want to be ready for his coming, not because that qualifies us for the rapture, but because it makes the difference between whether you are coming in with joy and running to see your bridegroom, free from the spirit of bondage and fear, your perfect love, his perfect love will cast out your fear and your conscience is perfected and you know that he's waiting for you with open arms. That is not natural to us. The natural state of the flesh and the unperfected conscience and the unrenewed mind is to be in a spirit of bondage and fear and say, oh, Lord, here he comes. I better hide. Okay. And uh, I remember when I first got saved, my friend was telling me about his friend. He was talking about the Lord and he was talking about his coming. And his friend was like, well, let's maybe the Lord could come tonight. And he got really scared all of a sudden because he realized he said, I'm not ready. Why wouldn't he be ready? We should be ready. We're regenerated. We're born of God. Well, the only reason he thought he wasn't ready was because his mind wasn't renewed about all the truths of who he is in Christ, and he wasn't standing confidently before the Lord. We should stand confidently before the Lord, okay? But it takes the renewing of our mind to cast down all the arguments in our mind and in our conscience and that the devil throws at us, especially in this evil day when the false doctrines and the accuser is so rampant. Uh, we have to be in the Word 
to wash our mind and we had to put on the armor. So what Paul talks about in Thessalonians, where he talks about watching, is put on the uh, helmet, the hope of salvation, and the breastplate of faith and love, the armor. You've got to put on your armor, you know. And it's not because you're not ready without the armor. It's because the enemy is throwing darts at you. <laughs> and you, we are contending with someone who's accusing us night and day. And the Lord wants us to be absolutely confident it is coming. And so the way he does that is he brings us into weakness and brings an end to our self-sufficiency so that we will look away from our life here and the signs and the things on the earth and really look at our righteousness who is in heaven, who's our advocate and our propitiation, our brother and our friend, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we'll get to know him so that when he comes, we run towards him and not shrink back. I don't understand fully what it means, but I know that there are going to be some who shrink back in fear when he comes, and he's going to have to comfort them to bring them into his presence. And that's not what he wants. He says, when I come, will I find faith in the earth? He is longing for us to have uh, a fully open stride running towards him with joy. Okay, And that's what he's preparing for us, uh, us for. That's why he brought us into the weakness. That's why he brought us in the path of Philadelphia where you have a little strength or no strength. He doesn't care that you don't have any strength and victory on your outward life. What he loves is the fact that you have looked, started to look away from the things which are seen and the things which are unseen. And while you're gazing at him, he's revealing the knowledge of his glory to you and working in you an exceeding weight of glory that will never fade away. And that's the glory that's going to be revealed in the sons of God. So when Romans talks about suffering, that we suffer with him, that we may glorify him, it's talking about this suffering of being brought into futility, where I just don't care about this life. I am looking for Christ. I must have him, right? Um, and then he says, likewise, the Spirit prays also helps us with our weaknesses. See, we're brought into weakness and futility. And that's our suffering with Christ. Now, it's a suffering with Christ, not because we're suffering his sufferings on the cross, but because he's the spirit. He is the high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, who ever lives to make intercession for us. And he is bound to us so that our weaknesses are felt as his own. We saw that in Hebrews, that um, he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And that is a touched with a present feeling as if they're his own. And he responds with his own intercession as if it's his weakness. And that blew me away when I saw that in Hebrews, that he's taken responsibility for my own Christian life. He's put me on. He's wearing me. Okay. And he feels my weaknesses and he prays. Because I don't know how to pray as I ought. How do I know how to pray for these things? All I can see is my, excuse me, weakness. And I long for him. But I certainly don't know how to pray. Well, he prays. The Spirit makes intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered. And there's the groaning. So the groaning is, on the one hand, your sense of futility. On the other hand, it is your taste of the Spirit. Well, it's first the taste of the first fruits of the Spirit, the pledging of the Spirit that came from a revelation of Christ. Okay, While you were looking not to those things which are seen, but the things which are unseen and getting a glimpse of his glory. Then that brought you into a place of weakness and suffering where you're like, if I don't have him, I got nothing because nothing else means anything. It brings you into futility. Well, that weakness brings you up against the spirit. And now he's interceding for you in your weakness as if it's his own with groanings. And those are the groanings that are the travail that are going to bring forth the uh, sons of God. So on the one hand, the earth is going through birth pangs, but we are travailing within ourselves. And it is produced by the spirit in us as a response to our weakness, but our weakness is a response to revelation. He produced the weakness into us by subjecting everything to futility, by showing us a living hope, which is the glory that's going to be revealed into us. And that made our whole life feel futile and brought us into weakness because we're not sufficient for these things. It brought us to a sense of the weakness and fragility of our earthly tabernacle while we long to be clothed with our habitation from heaven. And in that weakness, he starts praying in us. And that's the groaning. 
It's very amazing all the things that are happening. There's a lot more going on than we realize. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he, he that searches the hearts and knows what the mind of the Spirit for he makes intercession with the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For And then who he did predestinate, he also called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified he also glorified so he's saying this is how predestination works too this is why everything in your life is working out together for your good because the spirit is in you interceding according to your needs weakness your response to the environment your response to revelation christ in you it's all working everything together for good to conform you to the image of the son and bring you into glory and to make sure that you have all the experiences you need to be brought to an end of your natural strength so that you'll look away from yourself and look to him. So that when he comes, you are expectant and longing for him. You're not caught off guard. You're not drunk with the cares of this world. You're not full of anxiety about the things coming on the earth. You're not caught up in rapture signs and people's idolatrous rapture dreams. You're sober-minded. You, the loins of your mind are girded up and you're sober and you're waiting uh, and you're setting your hope perfectly on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, like Peter said. Uh, okay, my dog needs out. Um, it is so hard sometimes. There's so many distractions here. I'll have to keep this short. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Um, so that's the second part of the groaning uh, that I was talking about today. 